Hi, everyone. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Now, just to catch us up, Paul and Silas and some of the other guys were coming from Philippi, where Paul and Silas had been beaten, imprisoned, miraculously released, and yet they didn't run away. They led the jailer to the Lord and, of course, established the first church there with Lydia, who was actually from Thyatira. You may recognize that from the book of Revelation. And then he moves on, beaten and bruised, but glorifying the Lord to Amphipolis and Apollonia, and finally ending up in Thessaloniki or Thessalonica. And, of course, he has ministry there for less than three weeks until he's run out of town by people who just didn't like the effect of the gospel, that people were coming to Christ, uh, Jesus as the Messiah, and the Jewish leadership there got really angry, raised up a mob, and ran Paul and Silas and the rest of the guys out of town. Well, when they took off, they ended up about 60 miles to the southwest in a place called Berea. And of course, you know Berea is very, very noble in its reputation. Well, let's read about that because, frankly, a few of the things I'm going to share today are, well, you might say a little bit delicate concerning our Christian sensibilities, as you will see. I hope you don't take offense to some of the things that I say today. You see, that sounds like a bit of a tease. It's not. It's actually a bit of a warning because, frankly, well, the American church is pretty poor at being Bereans. And that's what I want to talk about today. So let's take a look here in Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 10, of what happened to Paul and Silas there in Berea. Verse 10, As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. That's from Thessalonica. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, there were other synagogues there, of course. There was probably a Samaritan synagogue there. They went to the Jewish one. Now, the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day. Why every day? Because Paul preached there every day to see if what Paul said was true. When he went into an area, he saturated it. Whenever he said something, they went home, they got out the Bibles, so to speak. But you know, I want to stop right there for just a second and let you know what's really going on here. First of all, when we're talking about the Bereans, we're not talking about some sort of a home Bible study or even a full church service like you might experience. We're talking about the leaders, the elders there in the synagogue, the people who are responsible for the community gathering of the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, because they didn't have, they didn't have Bibles. You didn't have a Bible in your hand to own until the 1600s. So back then, in those days, you wanted to study the scriptures. We're talking about doing it in the synagogue where they have the scrolls. So these are the leaders, the leaders who are leading the people. Very important. And that's our context today, too. The leaders who are leading the people are checking up on what is being said. Here is these guys, they come in led by the Apostle Paul, and they're preaching Jesus, a carpenter from Nazareth, crucified by the Romans, raised from the dead. Is what they're saying really true? How do we know that this Jesus was actually the Messiah and we're not waiting for somebody else? How do we know that we haven't missed a different Messiah? How do we know? And the question is really, what did Paul preach that they went and checked out? And it's very possible, as a matter of fact, it's highly likely that among the places where Paul preached Jesus as the Messiah to this group of Jewish people and these leaders at the synagogue there in Berea was probably out of Isaiah 52 and 53. Now, I'm not going to go into that today, but Isaiah 52 and 53. Did I say Isaiah 52 and 53? I think I did. I said Isaiah 52 and 53. That means go look it up and read it yourself. Be a good Berean. Because it talks about Jesus as the Messiah there, and not the Messiah that people were expecting to rule and reign with the sword and throw the Romans out and raise up an army and all of that, but the suffering servant. That's why it's a matter of sort of general opinion among theologians, and myself too, that that was at least one of the places where Paul preached out of 
to the Bereans because Isaiah scrolls were very, very important to the Jews and possibly more common than if some of the other scrolls, with the exceptions of the scrolls of Moses. But I digress. Now, they searched the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Verse 12, many of the Jews believed as did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. What's the deal with these prominent Greek women? Well, first of all, they are God-fearers, so they're Greek. They're not Jewish. They're converts in a sense, not to Judaism at this point. They were attending a Jewish synagogue and worshiping, uh, putting it in their terms, the God of the Jews. But now they're beginning to learn that Jesus is the Messiah and this God is a cosmological God. He's the God who made everything and no other gods are gods. And why these women, why prominent women? Well, they're patronesses. In other words, they're wealthy either from their own business works, which was rare, or it's because their husbands were rich and they would sponsor people to do various good works and benevolent works around the town, the city, whatever it was. And sometimes they would sponsor religious people, philosophers, or guys like Paul. Well, these women also were, generally speaking, illiterate because they didn't teach women their letters in those days. And these particular women don't have a lot to do. They're not regarded in a high way, even though they might have money, they're attached to a prominent man, that they don't, they're, they're not regarded as some sort of a very special person. This is the thing about Judaism that it recognized the different roles between men and women, physiologically and sociologically and everything else, culturally. But it put, especially Christianity, put women as equal in God's eyes with men, just different roles, and many of the roles even overlapping. That's the fascinating thing about what's going on in the scripture, how Jesus treated people. Jesus had female disciples, unheard of back then, but he did. And the way that he talked about women, the way that Paul talked about women was not typical of anyone in those days. And so Paul comes in and says that you have the same relationship with God through Jesus Christ as any man. Oh, that would get their attention and get them very, very excited. And a number of Greek men too. Verse 13, when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, so there were people who were getting out the word. Hey, do you know what's going on down there in Berea where I just came from? And the Jews, this is the Jewish leadership now, there in Thessalonica heard about it. Remember, they got Paul and Silas and, and whoever else is with them thrown out. But uh, at, at Berea, now you've got like either spies who followed them from Thessalonica or somebody who was just passing through and heading to Thessalonica and news gets around about such things. And the Jewish leadership who opposed Paul and hated his message got a bunch of people together and it says they were there too and agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who accompanied Paul thought, uh, brought him to Athens and left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. We don't know how long Paul was in Berea. It could have been uh, a number of days. Some people think it might have been about a month. It wasn't that long. But remember, the rabble-rousers now come down from Thessalonica. They raise up another mob there in Berea, and they get Paul out. They take him down to the coast, which isn't far away, and they put him on a ship, and off he goes down to a place called Piraeus, or Piraeus, there, which is the port city of Athens, and he gets off there. In the meantime, the other guys take off, and they're doing ministry in Thessalonica, and they're taking care of business, making sure the church is settled and well taken care of at that time. End of story. Except, we have to go back to the Bereans now as being more noble in character. If you take a look at that word in the original language, more noble actually translates out more excellent. There was an excellence in what they did. When Paul said something, especially among the Jews, they would, being very smart, intellectual, and having the Bible memorized, yes, we have heard that before. But the Bereans wanted to make sure. 
Even though no doubt the leadership knew the scripture, may have had large portions of it memorized, because in order to be a rabbi back then in various sects, you had to know the scripture sometimes by memory, the whole thing, or at least by memory, the, the Torah itself, or I mean, perhaps even on a lesser scale, parts of it, but you had to know it. This is why, of course, the Bible says faith comes by hearing, as Paul said, and hearing by the word of God. Paul, don't, don't forget, he was a converted Pharisee and he knew the word of God. And he knew the way that you learned it is that you couldn't own a Bible back then, not because it was wrong, but because it was too expensive and they were too infrequent. So you had to listen to it and you had to find ways to learn it and keep it in your head and keep it in your heart. And these guys in the synagogue get the scrolls out and they want to prove him right or they want to prove him wrong. But they want proof because they want the truth. God is truth. Now, I've been told many times and I've heard many places that the Bible contains the truth of God. That is a lie. The Bible is the truth of God. You see, if it just contains the truth, then who decides what part, what parts is the truth? Who decides that? And now you've got a big problem. The Bible itself can, is the Word of God, claims to be God's Word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, inspired by God Himself. He breathed into people who wrote this down. This is what He intended, and this is His truth. And on the basis that He says it's His Word, it's all that He wants to reveal to us contained in a book, there's more than that, by the way. It's very exciting. All that he wants to reveal to us is revealed in Jesus Christ too. And the Holy Spirit makes him known. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? But this book, thy word, doesn't contain the truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. Because it's either all truth or none of it is true. Because then the interpretation of the Bible is left up to us. And if you've ever heard somebody, and I'll talk about this later, you ever heard somebody say, well, the Bible is whatever you interpret it to be. That's not true. The Bible itself even says that it's not open to man's interpretation. It's read it and let it affect you. Don't interpret it. Read it and believe it. Read it and do it. This is where the Bible goes with this. Now, these Berean leaders knew the Bible is truth. And therefore, whatever is said about God, about his Messiah, about his intentions, about his will, about who's speaking his voice, you wash it through this. And that's precisely what they did. They got the scrolls out to say, Paul is telling us all this stuff. It sounds right. It sounds good. But indeed, is it true? Now, this is where... Don't turn this thing off, because you might be inclined to, and I hope not. This COVID-19 thing has brought a lot of things to the surface. And what I mean by that is like when you're trying to purify a precious metal, gold, silver, whatever, you put it in a pot, and then you heat it up and it liquefies, and then you put uh, some uh, this, this catalyst in there, and it draws the impurities to the surface, and you scoop them off. And then you do it again, and you scoop off more until the gold or the silver, whatever precious metal, gets purer and purer and purer. And it's a purifying process. And I think God is revealing to us our dross that gunk that floats to the surface there on molten metal when you're trying to purify it in order to make jewelry or pour out bars of gold or whatever it is you want to do with it. And I think through this COVID-19 thing, the dross is really starting to come to the surface, the impurities. And what I mean by that is this. If you happen to frequent social media, you know, Facebook and things like that, uh, YouTube, which you're watching this on right now, you're going to find all kinds of different opinions, thoughts, some of them so adamant and angry about this virus thing. Uh, I decided just to do a little experiment. And I went on Facebook. And for a couple of hours, I looked only at what Christians published there 
and I have about 4,000 friends, so that, that I don't know all these people, but they're on there, and God bless you. But I looked at all the things they posted for two hours, and I found an interesting pattern. Christians, and some of them I know very well, and they're very dear to me. But here's what I found in just two hours, citing reliable sources who these people, when they publish these reliable sources under their little Facebook area, had the best in mind for everybody. The sources are entirely believable. The Christians that I quoted, I'm going to quote here, aren't paranoid at all. They believe the truth. They want to set forth the truth. And here's what they said. Masks are good. Masks are bad. Masks do nothing at all. Virus deaths are understated. It's a conspiracy. Virus deaths are overstated. It's a conspiracy. Bill Gates is the purveyor of the mark of the beast. Chipping is the mark of the beast. Bill Gates might be the Antichrist. COVID-19 is a hoax. COVID-19 is only the beginning of a worse pestilence. Read this before Facebook takes it down. I'm still reading the same things month later, months later, and it's being reported as brand new. My, and you can fill in the blank, reliable news agency tells me the truth, except for all the others, even when the stories contradict. It's a medical issue. It's a political issue. It's a spiritual issue. You closed your church. You're ignorant. So that's really what's happening, and you're a coward. You closed your church, and you know what's going on, and... You're doing the best you know how. We're months away from opening our church. We're opening next week. Christian, declare your outrage and distrust and get into civil disobedience. Christian, obey the laws of the land and comply. Christian, love others. Christian, look down on others who don't believe what you know about COVID-19. It's all fake. My friend died from it. The doctors lied about the cause of death. Another friend of mine died from it. And so forth and so on. These things are so polarized. And the attitude that comes with them, at least in writing, so much of it sounds either perplexed, frightened, or really angry. But, now here it is. If... This is what Christians all over are doing with the facts of a common crisis. What are they doing to God's word of truth? Think about it. Who can we, who should we believe when it comes to COVID-19? Please don't write in and tell me who because frankly, I don't even know who to believe anymore. But I will tell you this, when Christians who are all over the place on something as important and big as what's happening in our world today are saying things of such disparity, good people, friends, what about when we look at the scripture? Are we as careless with this as we are with the data of a virus that could potentially kill you and a lot more people? Why search the scriptures? Why search this book? Why? How do you know what you believe is true? Because we're told by a lot of people what we should be believing. You go on YouTube and you find story after story being told on video of these things which you ought to believe about the Bible that contradict with so many other things. And yet, it's done in such a convincing, sometimes a highly produced way with a lot of money behind it. It must be true. How do you know? Search the scriptures. That's how we've got to know. We must know. Uh, someone says about the Bible, I mentioned this already. You're reading something, and it's pretty adamant. The Bible's very straight ahead, and somebody doesn't like it. And they say, well, that's your interpretation. Is it? How do you know it's not just your interpretation? Because frankly, and I will freely convince, 
that as I grow in the Lord, many of the things that I've been taught over the many decades that I've been a Christian, a lot of things I've had to back away from because I suddenly realized it was Summers' interpretation. But the more I read the Bible, the more I realized that even though I had tremendous respect for that person and may still do, that the Bible didn't say that. It said something different. And I made sure of it. And I realized that not everybody's perfect. As a matter of fact, you better check me. Don't just believe what I say. Get your Bible out and look. A very famous actor. Many of you know him. His name is Morgan Freeman. Very great actor and a very respectable man, but he's got an odd view on the Bible and on God, where he said, really, when it comes down to God, and he was the host of a show on the life of God that's there on, on uh, uh, cable and, and what have you, on, on uh, uh, streaming TV, he in the end says, really, the truth and the facts about God are, it's all just opinion. Do you believe it? Is it? Is it all just opinion? Hmm. Why search the scriptures? Because we got to know more than some actor telling us it's all just opinion. National Geographic Society, which is extremely hostile towards the church and towards Christianity, in a documentary that I was watching that was really cool. It was about the Greeks, and boy, they went into the history and how the Greek world worked. And But it's important to know that because it really did affect some of the things going on in the Bible. I'm watching this, and in the end, it plays up the church and Christians as being the number one anti-science, crazy, insane villains of all history. And there were some, for sure. But it's not the whole church, and it wasn't all of them. Hmm, but they sure made it out to look that way. Is the church that way? Are we that way? Are we anti-science, mean to people, going to dominate the world and put everybody in their place? Like, not just National Geographic, but others will say these things on huge media sources that have the ear of the world. Is it true? Search the scriptures. Someone else says, and we've heard this actually quite recently, that they've calculated the date of Jesus' return and numbers don't lie. Do they? Have we searched the scriptures? Do we know that anyone can actually calculate the date of Jesus' return when Jesus is him speaking for himself? I don't even know the day. If somebody says they know more than Jesus, I run the other way. Because lightning is a pretty big thing. Someone else comes along and says they have the mark of the beast all figured out or the identity of the Antichrist all figured out. Do they? They'll even quote scriptures on it. It's not up to you to debate them. It's up to us as Christians to search the scriptures to find out if it's true. Not to debate them, just find out if it's true. And yet the church can't even keep its COVID opinions to itself knocking heads with one another, and harshly too. We can't even check secular facts. What will the church do with the Bible? That's my concern, and that is a big concern. And as a pastor, as a person who gets a chance to go around and speak in a lot of places to a lot of people, I am very, very concerned about people digressing from this book because this book is truth. Not my truth, not my opinion, and not my interpretation. This is truth. And we lay every other fact and data at its feet. Especially when it's about the Bible and it's about Jesus. We need to search the scriptures. Why? How about another reason? Traditions. Traditions. You say, well, we're a modern progressive church. We don't do traditions. Yeah, you do. So do I, and so do we. We just don't think they're traditions because we just do them. And yet, I've just been reading a famous ancient historian, a fellow whose name was Eusebius. Some of you have heard of him, and he wrote a church history. And as he's writing this church history, he's bringing up what the church does and what the church is supposed to do. But he writes over 300 years after the time of Christ. 
And as he's writing, he's bringing up all these things that the church does and supposed to do. And as I hear them, he's saying, this is what we do as Christians. He considered himself a Christian. This is what, if somebody doesn't do them, then they're a heretic and they're, they have to repent and maybe they're going to burn in hell or something. And yet, when you listen to what he says and you check it with this book, you realize those traditions were the traditions of men, but they certainly were not the word of God. And yet, because he said it, well, it must be something factual about the way the church was back then. It was the way the church was at that time, but that's 300 years after Christ, even more than that. And Jesus taught his disciples something different, and it was written down here. Movements and trends. Why search the scriptures like the Bereans? Why be a good Berean? Because movements and trends come and go in the church. Are they real? Are they good? Are they of God? Movements that have blown through the church, like this ecstatic laughter movement. Well, a lot of people said it was a real experience. God bless you. I'm glad you had a real experience. But I look at that and I find nothing in there that God ever does in order to make me laugh for my sake. He always points me at Jesus to give me joy. And he always uses us and the movements of his Holy Spirit and the gifts of his Holy Spirit to bless others through us. You see, he gives us the gifts, spiritual gifts, blessings, in the form of the way I picture it, a package. Here's a beautiful package, like a birthday gift or a Christmas gift, but it's wrapped by the greatest, most wonderful, professional gift wrapper ever in the history of the world. And there's beautiful paper and a beautiful bow, and it sparkles and shines, and the label on it is sitting right there, and God hands it to me, and he says, here, take this. And I take it, and I'm really happy, and I want to open it up, and before I get a chance to tear the paper off, he says, ah, look at the label. And the label has somebody else's name on it. And God says, now give it to them. That's the way our gifts work. That's the way God gives gifts to us. But so many of the trends that come through the church are for us, for me. And they end up feeding my flesh. Or feeding my own intellect for the sake of being prideful about maybe how smart I am. Uh, some people will say, look, uh, I, I had an experience with God. And it's got to be right because it feels so good. A lot of things feel good. A lot of things feel good that aren't necessarily from God. Have you checked this? Well, it feels right. It doesn't matter if it feels right. Does God say it's right? Does God say it's good? Because some of the greatest feelings you could ever get might be completely false. We have the Bible. We have the Word of God. Like a good Berean, we dive in. Sometimes we even say, look, I know a thing must be true. Why? Because it works. A lot of churches have gone over to self-help. They're preaching more psychology on Sunday morning and therapy and, 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 and what have you on Sunday mornings and in Bible studies. Why? Because it works. There's a word for that in the world. They call it utilitarianism. And a lot of things do work in this world. And I'm not saying they're bad or that they don't work. I'm saying that the Word of God is where we discern right from wrong, good from evil. And the Word of God doesn't reveal to us self-help. It reveals to us the Helper, the Holy Spirit, and especially above all people, because the Holy Spirit reveals Him, Jesus the Messiah, and points us always back to Him. We search the Scriptures because all of these things, traditions, movements, trends, feelings, because it works, utilitarianism. We search the Scriptures to ask the question, are they true? Are they of God? Are they from God? Will they build up the church or even more so? Do they divide? Because a lot of these things do. I've noticed, if I could just give you a personal testimony here, take it for what it's worth. This is my history, not yours. But I've noticed in my history as a pastor, and I've been a pastor actually ordained since uh, 1982 was when I was first ordained as an assistant pastor, and in ministry since 1973 in one form or another. And during all of this time, I've noticed that believers, including me, guilty, very often believe what they want to believe. Believers very often believe what they choose to believe. 
because once again, it feels right, it sounds right, it's a tradition, so forth and so on, it works. But unfortunately, many Christians argue before they search the scriptures, and they too rarely search at all. And when they ultimately discover that they were wrong, perhaps out of pride, maybe they were wrong because they were shamed into believing something. Oftentimes I find these people, myself included, after so many years, they don't want to apologize. They want to run and hide, allowing the error to continue rather than saying, look, I was wrong. Let's correct this. But listen to me, and this is very important, and there's a lot of important points before we're done. The believability and authority of the Scripture itself is on the line. In this world, and especially in the church, because Christians want to believe so badly in so many different things, we have to take them all and weigh them through the lens of this book. What is God saying about it? And we have to be careful. Know the book. Learn the book. Why? Because it's God speaking to us. This is his voice. Not the only way he speaks. This is the one authoritative way in black and white in writing where he speaks to us. The scripture itself is either the authority over every teaching, doctrine, idea, book, movement, whatever you want to call it, to discern, to decide, even to divide like a surgeon's scalpel what is true of God, his commands, and his salvation, or not. Or it's wrongly regarded as something just to support positions, support my ideas, support my, my newfound doctrines of God. Pontius Pilate profoundly, but I think very cynically said, what is truth when he was questioning Jesus? Today's contradiction of doctrines are mostly from Christians. The teachings of the Bible you're not going to get the world debating the teachings of the Bible. They really don't care that much about it. You see, as I said in an earlier message, it's not the enemy at the door. It's the termites in the floor. Another important point. All biblical error, all scriptural error, began as truth. It just got watered down perverted, added to, taken away from, but it all started as truth. And listen to me, second part of this very important point. An error is easily believed if it errs in our favor. We like it. It feels good. It somehow plays into me. It will ease my struggle. It will make me wealthy. It will make me happy. It will give me a sense of superiority or authority. Uh, fill in the blanks. An error is easily believed if it errs in our favor. Errors are so easily embraced. Beware! Because a lot of errors will play to knowledge, and knowledge puffs up. It gives us a sense of superiority. I know I'm smart. It indulges our flesh. So many people who want to walk as Christians also seek where is the line morally so that, not so that I don't cross the line, but so that I can walk as close to the line as I can without crossing the line. If you're thinking like that, you've already gone too far. You've already crossed the line. You see, errors will, that are believable, that are embraceable, well, they will really indulge our flesh. Uh, errors will feed our personal pride. Errors typically say what we want to hear. Uh, for instance, there's a lot of trendy omissions out there. They've been around for, well, for thousands of years, but especially today with this, uh, you know, not only social media, but just the internet and everything else. Uh, and the way that churches can communicate back and forth, I love that, but it comes with some hazards. Because there are some trendy omissions where people in churches, pastors, ministers, maybe you, you're not addressing the true, crucial teachings of the Bible. You're not giving the Christians the whole counsel of God, which we're going to talk about when we get to Acts chapter 20 and Paul's last words to the Ephesian elders. There's 
unsettling doctrines that can bother us that maybe if we just kind of interpret them differently, see them differently, or just avoid them altogether because I can omit them so that I don't run my friends off or make them mad or be politically incorrect. Unsettling questions, unsettling doctrines, like hell, eternal hell, burning hell, like homosexuality, like sin, like one that should not be an issue but is rapidly becoming one because it's too big and for most people in our intelligent world it's not rational, the second coming of Christ and the rapture. Controversies, those untapped truths that are also so many, they're error-ridden, truths that tickle our itching ears. I have new knowledge. Let me write a book. I'll sell a million copies and you'll love it. I have new knowledge. Uh, how we were wrong about hell. I'm going back to that subject because it's so popular. Universalism has really taken off. Everybody gets saved. Really? Then why get saved, saved, saved at all? From what? Hmm. How we're wrong about hell. Perhaps things like, okay, here, I'm going to meddle now. Some of you might get really offended. But controversies like blood moons. You know, in that, there's a lot of stuff from the Bible in that, but there's also a lot of Christian, shall I say, astrology added to it. And that's a blending of sound doctrine, truth of the Bible, and paganism. Uh, the mathematical or astrological, astrological timing of Jesus' return. That was a big one a couple of years ago. Um, another one, things like the location of the temple. So what? The book of Enoch. It's not even biblical. And it wasn't recognized as part of the Bible. And when we get into all of these things, not by searching the scriptures, but by searching these other sources for these other things, you know what happens? The main thing is no longer the main thing, and the main thing is Jesus. Hey, I'm getting to preaching, aren't I? But that's the truth. The main thing is Jesus. And these peripheral things all really make the discoverer of such, the bringer forth of such things, a very popular and often a wealthy person. The Bereans searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. And that was excellence. That was true excellence in the eyes of God, in the eyes of the apostles, and in the eyes of the people that they were ministering to. Self-help, feel-good doctrines, undermining confidence in the absolute truth of the scriptures. Boy, this is a big one happening today, and it's happening in colleges and universities. It's happening on all the different channels on TV that have documentaries on the Bible and documentaries on all the different types of mysteries of the Bible and what have you. And they have these wonderful people who are talking heads and they smile and they have PhDs behind their name. But if you ask them personally, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? They will say, well, no. Why? Because it's not rational. So being rational is the biggest thing. It's almost like, a, uh, like an idol unto itself. And it's developed into something that maybe you've never heard of, and I'm not going to bore you with it. I'll just mention the name. It's called higher criticism. And it, it is a way to attack the Bible as saying we have to look at it rationally. And this has slipped into the church. It's slipped into universities. There's a university not far from here. Take me a half an hour to drive there. That was one of the top Christian schools in America, top Christian universities in America. And they have courses now that are teaching people that miracles do not occur and that God doesn't speak to people. Why? Because it's not scientific. It's not rational. How did that ever slip into our universities? Worse than that, the students are absorbing it like a sponge, and they're the next generation of Bible teachers. That's why we have to search the scriptures daily to make sure that what's being said is true, because more and more, with the great apostasy coming, the one that's predicted in the Bible, the falling away from sound doctrine and truth, you don't want to get caught up in that. It's not going to be an instantaneous thing. I, no doubt it's going to be a long, gradual process, but a fatal one. 
That's why we have the scripture. You test all things. You look it up. And this is truth. What people say to you, what doctrines come to us, what universities teach and so forth, are subject to the truth. Because the truth doesn't change. It doesn't become truer and it can't become less true. It's an absolute. And if you have your Bible in your hand right now, and I sure hope you do, you're holding on to an absolute, which is the most spectacular thing you can imagine in a world like ours. And then, and I got to start wrapping this up. Ha ha, not for a while, but we're going to try. There's church infighting. Church infighting, waging war against the wrong enemy where we're fighting over these doctrines because Satan will introduce them through good people with good intentions and some bad people with bad intentions. But I find really, honestly, in my observation, more often it's good people and all they want to do is help. But unfortunately, it just splits the church all over the place and it gets Christians really mad at each other. Ours is to discern the truth from error and we have the tool and it's right here. And it's written to peasants, by the way, so it's very easy to understand. Just take it at face value. And just do what it says. Never mind all the stuff. Just do what it says. And to continue to bless people in the body of Christ. Continue to preach the gospel. But this is your source. This is your truth. And I know that you know it. But it's the bedrock foundation of Christ. And when it's compromised by all these different things where we didn't search the scriptures daily to find out if what they said was true. The bedrock foundation one day we find is, made out, is, is turned to chalk and it begins to collapse. And I've seen people year after year in ministry get excited about the latest Christian book or the latest Christian movement without washing it through the scriptures before agreeing with it and suddenly they get in trouble or they get their congregations in trouble and they're leading them down the wrong path. But what does the Bible say? Do I really want to know the God of the Bible as he really is? in what he really is. If we're not sure, how do we find out? You've been given it, and it's in your hand. And this, listen carefully, especially if you're a pastor, an elder, a deacon, a minister, a Bible study leader in your church, a leader in your church. This is exactly why teachers of the Scripture will be, according to the Scripture, held up to a stricter judgment they are the ones who must shoot straight and accurate. They, us, they are the ones who must stay on mission. They are the ones who are required by God's calling and by God's scripture itself to rightly divide the word of truth. They are the ones who are to serve pure water and a healthy diet, not spiritual junk food, to God's sheep, to God's people. They are the ones who are to search the scriptures daily to see if what they hear, your people, your Bible study group, the flock, what, what, what they're hearing, if what they're hearing is true, if they're doing their homework, if they've done their homework, to keep pointing people in the right direction, not the preferred direction, not the popular direction, not the political direction, not even the happy direction, not the angry direction. God called church leaders, church teachers of Scripture to stay on subject, to stay on mission, because it's a minefield they're guiding their people through, and it will be until Jesus returns. That's why we study the Word of God. We study it to find out what's being said out there or in here in our church. And is it true? Listen, we don't ask people if what they, whoever they are, the people that put these propositions out there, these ideas, these movements, these trends, we don't ask people if what they said is true. We don't ask preachers. We don't ask presidents. We don't ask politicians. We don't ask science reporters. We don't ask bloggers, theologians, authors, if what they said is really true. We ask God if what they said is really true. That's what we do. And it simplifies things. I don't have to know so much. I just have to go to the Word and say, well, they said that. God says this. God wins. 
and we follow God. Paul told Timothy over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, he said this, listen carefully, this is the word of God. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best, Paul told Timothy. So this is to us, especially to leaders in the church, teachers of the scripture. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter. <laughs> Facebook. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Haven't we seen that? Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Isn't that what's happening? How about 2 Timothy chapter, two, uh, chapter 4, uh, where, excuse me, 3, let's get it right, where Paul said, all scripture is God-breathed, inspired. He... He breathed his word into people who then picked up the pen and wrote it down. And is useful, it's useful for teaching, rebuking. Maybe some of you feel rebuked right now. It's not my intention, but it happens. Correcting, training in righteousness, doing right things before God. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Chapter 4, verse 1. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. This is a solemn charge. This is not just saying a bunch of words. This is a charge. It's a promise. It's, a, it's like a vow being foisted on another person. You will do this. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, which is to come, I give you, Timothy, this charge. Preach the word. Not about the word. Preach the word. Not self-help, preach the word. Not the latest trend or the latest book, preach the word. Preach the word. And be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Why? For a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. This has happened historically over the ages, and it's happening now probably worse than it ever happened in, the, in all of history. A time will come when men will not put up, will not tolerate sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and aside to myths. This is why God gave to the church teachers of the word, be one. This is why God gave to us, to the world, his word, so that we could know the truth. So, here comes the newest and shiniest book, the newest and shiniest song, the newest preaching, teaching, discovery. Don't believe it until you've searched the scriptures. It's not like be mad at it or angry at it or, ah, I'm not going to believe that. Just, okay, I'm listening. Now I'm going to get my Bible out and I'm going to see what God says about what you said. That's all. You be a peacemaker. Being a peacemaker doesn't mean you give in. It means simply that you are, you're maintaining that bridge of peace with another person in order to show them what Jesus is really like and how much he loves them and how he washed our feet, you wash theirs. I mean... It's a no-brainer, but we get so emotionally wrapped up in these things, we can often send the wrong message. Be careful about that. And remember, searching the scriptures like this was something that couldn't easily be done until about 400 years ago. We live in a tremendous age. All the shelterings that we've been through, all the closings that have happened during this virus, it really has had one tremendous side effect, and God is like that. We'll think this thing is a curse, and in the end we go, what a blessing God made it, how he was glorified, because during these times, the hunger and thirst for God and the things of God and the word of God and prayer has exploded. And I'm not just saying here in America, certain foreign countries have noticed they're on the brink of a revival. Let's pray that it keeps going. 
because suddenly people are praying where they used to just put people down for praying and not believe in God. No, we're not going to pray. And suddenly, how do we do that again? Listen, who could ever add to who he is? Who could ever take away from who he is? Who could ever smear his name? We could. His name is wonderful. His name is perfect. But we still have the capability of smearing that name with shabby Christian facts, by misrepresenting him, by not studying his infallible word, but instead hearing what we want to hear or what we want to think others want to hear from him. But listen, God speaks for himself. He speaks for himself. He said exactly what he intended to say without asking anyone's opinion about it. He made himself through this book, a revelation of himself, he made himself knowable to the extent to which he wants to be known. We know of him, the Bible says, by just looking at nature. He exists, but so much more. We know him by what he said through his word. Get it right. It's him who is doing all the talking, all the revealing. We know him by his son. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And we know him through his Holy Spirit, who always points us to Jesus, who always shows us the father. Isn't that great? That's our Berean duty. It's to listen to what he said and believe it. And we, and the world, will know what we believe. We'll know the truth about God. And that we really believe it by our actions as a result of what we claim to believe. You know the truth, and you say you believe it, then what comes next will reflect that truth. And that will reflect Jesus because it is written of him in the volume of the book. The truth. It's all about him. On our website, we have a little motto up that I think most people ignore. I can't really even pronounce it. It's Latin, but agere sequitur credere. But what it means is actions follow belief. The truth will lead to actions that please and bless God, save others, and show the world who he really is. Which is why the Bereans were an excellent people and why we remember them at all, even today. God bless you and be a good Berean.